Hold on, hold on, hold on. Where is the end? Ah. Good morning. I'm so pleased to be back with you today for the last day of the Reluxury Talks. We have an amazing program. And I could summarize the day with we should go beyond, beyond circularity, beyond um, in terms of you know, customer experience, in terms of trustability, in terms of courage. This morning, we have amazing speakers. And we will start the day with Leanne Kemp from Everledger with a talk called Stop Bullshitting, the best way to build trust. Please. That, that's a great introduction. <laughs> wow, OK, well. Um, great to be here. You know, there's been a lot of talk lately around blue ticks. Um, they're once the coveted authenticity tick or the marker. And let's talk today uh, in the opening part about Twitter. You know, it's the go it was the goal of many people, many celebrities, journalists and organisations, and a badge announcing who you were or who you claimed to be. We even have a blue tick here, authenticity guaranteed. But like him or not, Elon Musk has turned the badge into a monthly charge for anyone willing to pay. You know, it's gone from being a public verification to a pay per user, or like I say, a pay to play. And you could have a tick a month, one month, and then the next you could simply just leave it and walk away. And the town hall of the internet is now more a bit like an arcade. In the world we find ourselves, I ask, is the blue tick enough? And what is beyond the blue tick? What speaks louder in the 21st century to all of us today? Is it a reputable name or is it reputable deeds? The do good while doing well. So my company Everledger exists to unveil some of the most opaque and conflicted supply chains in the world. We're obsessed by it. We work in tracing diamonds and gemstones, work in luxury goods and textiles, and most importantly today around critical minerals that's driving the renewable energy infrastructure, such as solar panels, wind turbines, and electric vehicle batteries. I started the company in 2014. It was pretty much me in a backpack. Um, and now we have over 4 million gemstones with complete traceability from the source of the mine right the way through to the retail network. We have about 100 people in the company with five operational centers and we touch customers in 35 countries around the world. And our philosophy is actually quite simple. We want to know where something comes from and then once its primary use fades or changes, we want to know what happens next. We started back in 2014 by tracking diamonds from the source of the mine through its extraction, cutting, polishing, and then right the way into the retail network. And we started here because the story of a diamond is a hyper-consolidated, ge geographically dense supply chain. And in many ways, it gives us a roadmap of an exemplar industry where it can evidence the transparency in that supply chain. Now look, I don't like to say we're a blockchain company, um, as we are not a traditional bunch of crypto bros that's thinking about what we can do to tokenize stuff. But of course we use blockchain. We use that and a whole bunch of other technologies. I liken it to a symphony of technologies that come together to enable that immutable record and that identity. And these technologies are foundational building blocks to identify authenticity, granted. But I'll let you know in a second that tech companies are rarely just about the tech. Our work isn't in the technology. Our work is in the systems enablement, the human system, and most importantly, enabling the uh, rewiring of the economics. Quite simply, it's the alignment of values and value in a supply chain or industry that enables that change to occur. The journey we unveil is from the origin right the way through to authenticity to a life cycle, to use and reuse, and serves every part of that very complicated puzzle piece. Now, impact, of course, is another buzzword. It's thrown around these days like you never before heard. And we shouldn't diminish its significance. 
When I think of impact, I think of people, planet, and prosperity. And we shouldn't just be thinking about the price tag as the cost of a customer to pay, but what about the cost of the planet? Can we honestly continue to live in an abundant world where what is new is good and what is old can simply be discarded? Certainly in the West, we've been living in an age of abundance, undeniably. So much so that we're also living in a world where trash is in abundance. We've polluted the planet, the abundance through a linear economy that take, make, create, and then throw away. So now is the time we should think going beyond that blue tick. Where's the green tick? And not just a faded, barely visible watermark that amounts to little more than a greenwashing sign, um, but a strong and true, transparent look at the objects. So if the blue tick is a KYC, the authenticity of the company or the person, then we need a green tick for it to be the KYO, the know your object. So my argument is this. There are many companies and people with really good reputations. But equally, how do we see those reputations? Because they're often built on sand, a shifting dynamics in our societal notions. What constitutes good is really the question, and that's rapidly evolving. The more we know, quite simply, is the more we know. But it's not always the more we show. Consumers are using their voice and platforms to ask questions and are not satisfied with the answers. And practices like changing the blue tick on Twitter to a subscription service will no doubt enable that uh, the faith further um, and lull us into some false hope of thinking that as long as we have the money, we control the story. So let's take another example. Carbon. Carbon trading, which I'd argue now is at a turning point. One where blockchain technologies has the power to make a lasting impact. And already, crypto-backed trading organizations are looking at carbon credits. And they've been heralded as a savior by enabling transparency in the record keeping and ensuring companies and users can't double dip into that system. But when it comes to the offsetting, credits do occur multiple times. Now, after all, isn't the whole point of carbon credits where they were designed as a way to offset environmental degradation, not just a money-making adventure? There are example companies around the world that are launching public consultations to discuss this very real topic, the importance of KYC, that blue tick, yet again, on the crypto instrument or on the token holder itself. Their own blue tick, if you will, that pay-to-play, here it comes again. Now, with this signal, it's clear that merely tokenizing an existing system with a business-as-usual approach isn't going to cut any value creation. And maybe it's time we think about an entirely different system. Yep, the blue tick can stay. We need it. We need to have a KYC check. But let's open up to a green tick, one that verifies the actions, one that verifies the value creation, one that verifies the impact. So here's a thought. It's time to move away from offsetting greenhouse gas emissions to insetting them instead. And blockchain, sure, can be a technology tool that will enable it. It's a scaffolding, and it so should be. But the old market schema has proved itself to be flawed. Instead of simply recreating it with new technologies, why don't we rewrite that narrative and begin a new decentralized, transparent system to enable that value? Today, we're standing right at the crossroad. In the next 48 hours, I'm heading into Egypt with this exact topic in largest decision makers and financiers in the world that are now financing these scope three greenhouse gas emissions. The time is running fast to avert what is arguably a danger on the horizon. The more we use carbon credits, the more pressure we're passing on to our future selves. Corporations and industries are signing up for that net zero target and deadline. But in reality, aren't we just pushing the changes to some vague future date by promising to offset an emission that we're creating in today's world? There's hope, however, for those that instead of offsetting, we turn to insetting. The practicality of that is insetting puts the responsibility 
directly onto the companies that are admitting those um, carbon emissions. It could look like this. Removing carbon from your very own supply chain or improving sustainable management practices at the source. We have a platform that traces all of Australian wool. So here's a real world example. A wool producer, for example, could look at creating the best environment for its sheep. Rather than purchasing credits to plant trees 10,000 miles away, the diamond industry, it could be manufacturing facilities to install solar panels and wind turbines directly on the roof of their facilities rather than purchasing off a wind farm in a whole nother country or a whole nother region in India. Those that are at the forefront of retail to consumer can be that economic engine to drive those insettings. So carbon insetting is less focused on the impact of the inset themselves, but instead they're focused on driving the business value, that paradigm shift that's so desperately required. And carbon insetting can also be more appealing to companies because investing in these insetting principles and projects can make a company's supply chain more resilient and improve the quality, arguably, of its raw materials. So a stitch in time saves nine, as they say, and the future is being built today. And we know that what we do right now has an impact on tomorrow, next year, and 100 years from now. And we know that with every passing year, an extra 50 billion tonnes of carbon is spewing into our atmospheres. And we're short of changing our future selves and the generation. But humans, let's admit, we've never really been great at doing the hard work today so that tomorrow can be better. We're pretty lazy. And it might be not as sexy as carbon credits as we know today, but transparency in supply chains built around the metrics of scope one, two, and most importantly, scope three, will have a profound effect on our collective future. Dabbling in carbon credits might feel good at the time, and afterwards, it feels a bit empty in the stomach. It's equivalent to me of eating some fast food at the corner shop. But the feeling that you get from enabling a carbon inset may not be the whole answer to the equation, but I'd wager that it'd be it would leave you with a feeling of nourishment that lingers for longer. So what if, instead of putting aside our emissions or offsetting our activities in meaningless ways, we turned inwards, using carbon insetting as the new standard to make that lasting change, and underpin that beyond the blue tick with a green tick. So I'm going to leave you with this. In the past 50 years or so, our understanding of material science has expanded exponentially. And we know how to make things better, we know how to authenticate it, we know how to make things faster and cheaper. In fact, it's a race to the bottom. But now, we're in the ascendancy of climate and environment science, where it's not just enough to know the science of how we build something or what we build it out of, but we also have to measure and make accountable the impact on what it's having in our future. So I'll be back here next year, by which time I hope we don't just have a blue tick on these posters, but a green tick alongside proving that we can be good while doing well. Thank you. <laughs>